Hello everyone. Myself Guru Swami from GE Healthcare. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session. In today's webinar, you will learn how to expand your expertise in liver imaging by using the advanced tools like liver fat quantification UGAP and two dimension shear wave elastography. Especially how to do a structured reporting of fat quantification and elastography. Any question during this session, please use the chat box. We will take it up in the end. We do have polling session at the end of the program. Please do actively participate in the polling session. It's my privilege to introduce our eminent speaker, master in all ultrasound speciality, pioneer in shear wave elastography and fat quantification, Honorable Dr. Chandar Lula, sir. Dr. Chandar Lula, sir, is head of ultrasound department, Jaslok Hospital, senior consultant at Reliance HN Hospital, Mumbai, and consultant at Rio Clinic, Bombay. His achievements are countless. Few of them includes ex-president of IFUMB, ex-counselor of AFSAM, ex iswa ambassador for India. It's time to welcome our beloved speaker. Dear sir, please enlighten us with your knowledge and experience. Over to you, uh, thank you, Guru, uh, for these kind words. And I thank G for uh, allowing us to uh, bring our work forward to uh, uh, all our friends uh, in, in the radiology world. Um, I uh, can you hear me and see me properly? Yes, sir. Perfect, sir. Uh, so I will just share the screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So expanding the turf with liver imaging is the topic today of discussion. And uh, I, I like to begin with this slide. Uh, a healthy liver is not a destination, it's a journey, a daily process, because this is something all of us need to look after uh, in our body from day to day basis. And I'm sure uh, we uh, in the post COVID era, now, we are very conscious, we are very aware that health is very, very important for our well being. We have lots and lots of new imaging tools with ultrasound, but we're going to focus only on a fat estimation that is UGAP and 2D shear wave imaging, better known as elastography or fibroscan. I will begin with the case because that's how I started my career uh, in, uh, in uh, fi fibroscan and liver expanding my turf. Uh, this was a gentleman who came to me. Uh, he was m almost 100 kgs uh, about a year back and uh, he had uh, severe uh, uh, he was a vegetarian, but his father had cirrhosis. He died of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and he was 112 kgs. With, uh, uh, and when he presented to us, uh, he had severe diabetes, hypertension. He was on insulin. Resting heart rate was 110, glycohemoglobin 8, very high cholesterol, altered LFT. And uh, uh, he had severe fibrosis, almost uh, on the verge of cirrhosis. Uh, when we did his uh, fibroscan and elastography on the logic E10. And then uh, we counseled him because uh, he wasn't looking too good. He was quite depressed and he, he's a non-alcoholic, complete vegetarian. Uh, and uh, obviously we were dealing with uh, NASH leading to cirrhosis. We put him on a diet plan. Uh, it was very simple diet plan, very limited meals, regular meal timings. Uh, we just reduced his working hours. He was a workaholic, like most radiologists. And uh, we put him on a walking one-hour daily uh, diet. And six months later, he, uh, he was uh, uh, rid of his diabetes. He was no longer on insulin. His glycohemoglobin had dropped from 8 to 5. Resting heart rate was 60. And he had started enjoying life. This was his initial, he had done a fibro scan some time back. And then uh, after the diet plan that we put him on, this is how he looked uh, after post uh, uh, the diet and the exercise plan, almost half his size. 
and you can see uh, that uh, his lipid profile was normal. He was no longer on statins, normal LFTs. We had completely reversed the uh, disease and he is 70 kgs today. And this is how his uh, uh, cap and uh, shear wave velocities and the fibrotic score dropped sequentially uh, from 21 to 22. Uh, so we started with uh, the cap at 178 and then we uh, brought him down uh, to 0 0.59 S1, S2 stage uh, measured in decibels, centimeters per MHz. Early we were measuring with meters. And then KPA dropped from 14 to 5, near normal. So you can see that even as high a value as 2.3 uh, is today 1.37. These are his laboratory values and you can see everything has a downturn. His cholesterol values, his sugar values, his glycohemoglobin, etc. Uh, stimulated by this, uh, we, we kept this video on our screen and we have almost every day patients coming to us. And this is another 40-year-old, 95 kilo. Today, he is 85 kilo. And uh, he was very stimulated with this video. And he uh, embarked upon the same journey. Today, he's got a fatty liver grade 1. Earlier, it was about grade 2. His uh, uh, RF value or the fibro scan value is down from 1.37 uh, to 1.18. So these are some of the uh, success stories that we have been dealing with. Now, this was a sad situation. Uh, I just put this case to highlight the fact that sometimes this disease is so, uh, liver disease is so silent that they, they actually come to us uh, at a, a very late stage. So this is a case of fatty liver. Uh, otherwise, the liver looks absolutely normal. But you can see here an ill-defined hypoechoic mass at the porta, and uh, that's the region of the mass there. And uh, biopsy proven hepatocellular carcinoma in a patient with uh, uh, steatohepatitis. So uh, sometimes uh, this is a very rare presentation. And of course, this is the focus of our talk today. We don't want uh, people to land up in this situation. So uh, life depends on the liver, as I say. And uh, we can see that it is the second largest organ in the body. And uh, it, 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 uh, it uh, has about 10 to 15 percent of the total blood volume of the body at any point of time. In almost the entire blood circulates through the liver. It has over 500 functions and it is the only organ that can regenerate. So uh, we have uh, the functions of the liver. Uh, it helps uh, in all these complex metabolism and de uh, detoxification uh, mechanisms. It synthesizes and secretes bile, and it's also a storehouse for gluco uh, glucose and for the energy of the uh, body. Now, uh, uh, we then, due to uh, abuse by various factors, land up with fatty liver, and then the patient comes with this kind of situation, uh, asking us, do I have fatty liver in the moment? In the past, uh, we used to talk of liver. Uh, we, used to, we used to always question, how much do you drink? And of course, now we know that uh, alcohol is not necessarily the leading cause of steatohepatitis. It is a bad diet and, uh, as I call it, McDonaldization of society. So the liver, either due to alcohol or more commonly now metabolic disease, as we call it, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is now called as metabolic fatty liver disease. Uh, can have insult due to obesity, increased amount of lipid, diabetes, drugs, and all this leads to steatosis, uh, inflammation, fibrosis, and finally cirrhosis. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the benign stage of the disease where there is simple steatosis without hepatocellular uh, injury. This is, of course, benign and limited prognostic relevance. The moment there is inflammation and continuing insult, we land up with NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, coined, the term was coined first in 1980 by Ludwig et al. to describe the typical biopsy features of, sig uh, uh, of significant inflammation. So there is uh, macrovascular steatosis, inflammation, what we call as ballooning of the hepatocytes and uh, predominantly centrilobular distribution. And this is a progressive disease. Uh, and if you have an environmental exposure, to toxins and a susceptible genetic background, this can lead to rapid progression uh, to hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis. 
So we begin with simple steatosis. As I said earlier, it's about in seen in 89, uh, fortunately in 80 to 90 percent, there's a benign cause. But in 10 to 20 percent of patients, this will progress through various stages of uh, uh, fatty liver disease, type 1, type 2. Type 1 is simple steatosis, type 2 is steatosis plus inflammation, type 3 where we start talking about NASH when there is hepatocyte injury and ballooning and then 20 to 50 percent will land up with about fibrosis that is type 4 NASH and 2 to 5 percent will land up ultimately uh, with uh, cirrhosis uh, and hepatocellular carcinoma. Of course, this is a long process and it may take about 10 to 20 years, but we now are in a position to diagnose those various stages and put in institute corrective health measures as, as with the first patient I showed you. So in the initial part, when we are dealing with the evaluation of the liver, uh, we can use the attenuation parameter, the ultrasound guided attenuation parameter or UGAP to analyze the fat estimation in the liver. In the moment, there is progressive liver disease. If there is altered LFT or um, we have other symptomatic problems, uh, we then also use shear wave elastography to diagnose fibrosis and further progression into cirrhosis. So this is the pathogenesis of the progression. We have initially lipogenesis, that is dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, which is now the biggest problem worldwide, obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, leading to uh, lipid deposition. This causes oxidative stress and all the other inflammatory pathways are activated, which causes inflammation, NASH, fibrosis, and finally cirrhosis, cell damage, and scarring. So that's the uh, uh, progression of the disease. This is what actually happens in the liver. We don't need to go into this, but uh, every stage has been well identified. You can see that there is increased insulin, which is the biggest problem, increased glucose, faulty diet, excessive caloric intake, and uh, uh, then there is hepatic insulin resistance, which causes lipogenesis, increased uric acid, triglycerides. And finally, there is steatohepatitis, where the plasma glucose also increases. And uh, we have a lot of oxidative process, apoptosis, and finally, macrophage activation, fibrosis, and uh, cirrhosis. Now we have different stages of NAFLD. So type one is where there is fat alone, fat plus early inflammation type two, and cirrhosis develops in about 4% of these cases. The moment we have ballooning of the hepatocytes, that is a, an advanced stage of uh, NAFLD that is type three, and then there is malory body deposition fibrosis type four, and a large percentage of these will lead to cirrhosis. Now there is a strict definition of NAFLD. Uh, because we need to differentiate these conditions. Uh, the treatment would depend on the various conditions. So when we, when we talk of uh, uh, fatty liver disease, essentially uh, we, we talk about histopathologically, there is more than 5 to 10% of lipid amount in the liver weight or lipid vacuoles filling more than 5% of the hepatocytes. So this is, of course, advanced lipid deposition here. What is very important is that patient does not have a, a ethanol history or the history is less than 14 drinks per week. That is about two glasses of wine per day or no alcohol consumption. Of course, you can check for uh, ethanol and transferrin for other uh, liver diseases in the uh, uh, patient's blood. And of course, there should be absence of serological evidence of hepatitis B and C and no use of uh, long-term therapy like methotrexate and tamoxifen. And that's when we call this condition uh, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the prevalence is today very high. Almost three out of 10 of us will get liver disease uh, while we are indulging in our weekend sprees. So this is the, uh, the incidence worldwide. You can see almost 25 to 30% of adults, 10% of children, uh, and not surprisingly so with uh, sedentary lifestyle. This increases to almost 75% amongst obese patients and uh, diabetic patients. 
and you can see that apart from the united states which has a very high incidence i have not put that here because the incidence is well known uh, most of the other parts of the continent including asia the incidence of obesity is on the rise and incidence of nash is on the rise now this is also very uh, interesting uh, i would say about 20 years back Uh, most of the patients coming to a liver clinic would be due to either hepatitis c b or alcohol but if you see from 2014 till date the largest number of liver transplants that were done at the global hospital were due to nash and not due to the other conditions so this is rather interesting so this is is a rapidly progressing disease which we need to look into symptomatology it may be silent in the initial stages and most of the patients come for checkup but at, as as the disease progresses you may have uh, uh, what we commonly see is abdominal pain on in the right upper quadrant and that is something uh, that most patients present with because of hepatomegaly uh, they have uh, uh, with, with advancing disease uh, more fibrosis of course uh, more state of hepatitis and nash loss of appetite nausea fatigue is an important uh, complaint and then of course once chronic liver disease sets in we have the uh, symptomatology etiopathologically chronic liver disease can be due to toxins various toxins alcohol etc infections can be immunological apart from obesity and the other conditions and this is the whole range of conditions that can affect uh the the liver which can be a target organ from our point of view from the point of view of nafld obesity type 2 diabetes hypertrichoglycemia and the metabolic syndrome which is now very very important is the established risk factors the associated risk factors i would say the genetic influences we are seeing because of more testing now in the pediatric population uh, a lot of genes are being identified for nafld uh, then we have hypothyroidism hypopituitarism sleep apnea pcos parenteral nutrition excess fructose intake we'll talk about this is a very very important new um, uh, feature because a lot of a uh, uh, young population is exposed to a lot of fructose corn syrup and lot of fructose drinks rapid weight loss can also lead to fatty liver disease so we must remember that when we counsel our patients the weight loss has to be gradual and of course all of this uh, is more in people with obese obesity and diabetes so these are of course high caloric diets and all the wrong foods and meats and uh, sedentary lifestyle and sugar which is the, the big problem but today fructose corn syrup is something that you need to look for in every packaged uh, substance that you purchase uh, uh, because if this has fructose corn syrup please avoid it uh, it it causes uh, endothelial dysfunction causes liver hepatocyte dysfunction pancreatic inflammation and diabetes and kidney uh, uh, chronic renal disease so this is something that needs to be highlighted into all our uh, patients fructose Uh, uh, it, it stimulates the bad microbia in our uh, in our abdomen and this causes hepatocyte injury and steatosis of course with the use of prebiotics and probiotics prebiotics are healthy foods which uh, allow the healthy bacteria to grow in our digestive system uh, these are types of fiber that feed the friendly bacteria then the probiotics are beneficial bacteria already present and we should not destroy them with the massive use of antibiotics so these three terminologies prebiotics probiotics and antibiotics you should be um, the, uh, the looking into to have the good microbia and allow uh, the healthy bacteria to allow the liver to be normal now from the point of view of our radiology practice you see that uh we have uh, um, a lot of patients coming for recurrent or repeat liver evaluation because we have about 40 to 50 million hbsag carriers hepatitis b carriers we have about 1.2% that is nearly 12 million uh, hepatitis c carriers and alcohol of course 7.8 million but the most important thing is that uh, the obesity is uh, increasing this should be 30% not 2% compared with about 60% in the america so these patients require repeated uh, 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 evaluation 
and uh, 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 NAFLD is not a liver disease alone. You can see that it causes a lot and lot of other problems apart from obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease is one of the big problems, cardiac abnormalities, chronic renal disease, polycystic ovarian disease. So it is a systemic disorder. And therefore, uh, we are now calling this uh, not uh, only a, a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but we are calling it a metabolic associated fatty liver disease. So MAFLD. And there's a strong association between liver fat and uh, the, uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease. So steatosis today, the grade of steatosis of the liver is the most important risk factor for the development of endothelial dysfunction in NFA, NAFLD. And you can see a lot of young people recently uh, uh, having uh, problems with uh, myocardial disease at a very, very young stage. And this is probably the reason of uh, and, uh, due to endothelial dysfunction. So the moment you identify fatty liver, in fact, you should be on alert to rule out diabetes, hypertension, hypertriglyceridemia, and um, uh, low levels of the good cholesterol in these individuals. You can see that these are the high risk uh, of, uh, of various conditions uh, which uh, are associated with uh, fatty liver disease. And even mortality uh, is, is associated with the stage of NASH. So the increase, there is an indefinite increase in mortality with uh, uh, the, the increase of uh, NASH in, in, the, in the liver. Now, the good news is that this condition is potentially reversible. And uh, you have seen in my first patient and also in the subsequent patient, uh, both NAFLD and NASH uh, is reversible. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, of course, we talk about cirrhosis being non-reversible, but when we have extensive severe fibrosis almost reaching to the stage of cirrhosis, we have seen even that reversing. And this can be possible due to lifestyle modification, antiviral therapy, in, and of course, uh, immunosuppressants and autoimmune hepatitis. And these are some of the recorded uh, recoveries uh, even following hepatitis C and hepatitis B, we have fantastic drugs today available with a cure rate of almost 95 to 96%. And this I'm talking about 2014 and 15, and I'm sure this has progressed further. So you can see that there is histological regression of almost 91% in fibrosis and even documented regression of cirrhosis in 70% of the patients after participating in a five-year therapy program. So how does one know you have liver disease, whether it is significant fatty liver and whether it is significant liver disease? So these two are the questions uh, most patients will ask you. Uh, most of the time, they will either come on a checkup program, so they may or may not come with a serology. Uh, but serology is very non-liver specific and specifically AST and ALT, that is the SGPT and SGOT ratio, uh, it can be affected by kidney diseases and various other conditions. Uh, AST is of course more liver specific and if the ratio is higher, as you can see, uh, specifically if it is more than two, uh, it is indicative of alcoholic hepatitis because there is more liver damage, uh, viral hepatitis more than 1.2. but in non-alcoholic liver hepatitis, this ratio is not significantly altered. Uh, Wilson, of course, it is very high, it's more than 4.5. We have other serum biomarkers also indicating for uh, NASH, and you can see that the, the area under the curve for most of these serum biomarkers for predicting NASH was not more than 0.8. And we, I'll show, we'll see later, uh, UCAP performs uh, much better, more than 0.9. Even the enhanced liver fibrosis panel, that is a, a multiple serum-based test, uh, uh, has a very poor aura for discriminating mild to moderate fibrosis. In fact, it is uh, only useful for severe fibrosis where it can match uh, with UCAP. So we, we need non-invasive markers, and that's where the development of ultrasound-based non-invasive technologies uh, we, we, uh, like FibroScan, shear wave elastography, and of course, MR elastography are very useful in the management of these patients. Liver biopsy has been a traditional gold standard. It is the best available gold standard and it is not really the gold standard because it is an invasive uh, 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 technique and can cause complication in about 1% of cases. Biopsy represents only one 
uh, out of 50,000 of the liver volume, which may result in sampling error because this is a heterogeneous disease. And if you don't, by, by chance, as a sample, the correct area, you may get a subjective, uh, I mean, you may get a lower estimation of the disease. And also there is a considerable inter-observer variability between the pathologists. And uh, this has been shown in various studies. Uh, we also have difficulty in repeating biopsy. It is insensitive for fibrosis progression and regression in a few weeks to months. And uh, most of the patients uh, that require biopsy are severe disease and therefore this causes uh, the bias in the validation of our non-invasive tests more towards the se severe disease uh, uh, state states. Now you can see there are various pathology studies. I have only included one uh, where there is a lot on lot of sampling variability of liver biopsy in, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So even in NAFLD, there is, um, the, you can see that uh, histological lesions of NASH are unevenly distributed throughout the liver parenchyma. Therefore, sampling error of liver biopsy can result in substantial misdiagnosing and staging of inaccuracy. So, so sometimes people call me up that I'm getting variable results in the liver. Now that is the very various, uh, the, the disease process is such. And you can see from uh, retrospectively from biopsy studies, we are learning that just biopsy just takes one sample. And uh, we take multiple samples uh, when we are doing shear wave or uh, UGAP uh, analysis. So sometimes you land up getting multiple results. And that's why we, we, we take the median, we do an uh, averaging, we take the median value, not, not the mean value, the median value, and we, we remove the extreme values because this is a heterogeneous disease. And you can then understand why you get varied results sometimes and why you need to take multiple results when you're getting varied results uh, to get a median value. At most times with these new technologies, uh, we will get homogeneous results and in, in, in with 2D shear wave because you're taking most of these sampling measurements in one box, in one site. Uh, you, if you move your ROI to various areas of the liver, which we, which we used to do earlier with uh, point shear wave elastography or what, what can happen with uh, fibro scan because that's a point shear wave. Uh, they are moving the uh, point shear wave all across the liver. It is bound to cause uh, uh, inaccuracy. And that can be understood from the pathological studies. Uh, if they, they, in this particular study, they did two biopsies for every patient. And there was, uh, there was a, a lot of discordance in the hepatocytic ballooning, almost 18%. Uh, and uh, uh, ballooning would have been missed in 20 per 24 percent if only one biopsy was performed. Uh, so you can see the negative predictive value was at best 0.74. Uh, so by very nature of this disease not being uniform, just doing one biopsy or doing fibro scan with uh, almost like a, two, a point shear wave elastography is absolutely inaccurate. And therefore, the new gold standard in coming years will definitely be 2D shear wave elastography, uh, which will give us a better understanding of this liver disease. Now, when you do a biopsy, it has to be a minimum two to three centimeters in length. You have to use a 16 gauge needle and you need minimum 11 portal tracks. And if this is not there then that biopsy is not accurate uh, the biopsy grading of fatty liver osteoporosis is uh, best described by the brunt score we have grade o one two three four just like we have grade one two three fatty liver and uh, this is zero percent fat deposition less than 33 percent zero to five percent i would say less than 33 percent 33 to 66 more than 66 percent these are the four stages and this is what you would see on the biopsy, simple hepatic steatosis uh, with, uh, in the hepatocytes without injury. Then you start seeing these small black dots. These are the mallory bodies. Uh, and this is macrovascular steatosis with inflammation. And finally, you see fibrosis uh, and scarring. And that is the, the end stage or cirrhosis. From, from the point of view of academically uh, understanding, these are the various components of the histological, histopathological abnormalities that you would see in steatohepatitis. So you will see steatosis, lobular inflammation, hepatocellular ballooning, which is very, very important. And um, the other factors are, of course, fibrosis, uh, the presence of the mallory bodies, etc. 
Now, this is the NASH activity score, uh, which uh, uh, what we estimate with UGAP is, uh, this is of course a histopathological score and a combination of this, the steatosis, lobular inflammation and hep hepatocytic ballooning uh, gives the final diagnosis. And this is what we are actually uh, trying to achieve with the UGAP uh, situation. The, uh, beyond Going beyond uh, steato, uh, steatosis, we go on to steatohepatitis, fibrosis, and then we use the ISHAP or the Metavir scoring. The Metavir scoring is more well known. Uh, it is F1, F2, F3, F4. So the, these are the various uh, degrees of inflammation. So you have portal tract fibrosis, then few septae, numerous septae, and finally cirrhotic nodules in F4. And this is what it would look at on, uh, uh, on the histopathology, multiple septae, few septae, and then finally cirrhotic nodules. Now on ultrasound, for fat estimation, we would, uh, we would on 2D ultrasound look at the echogenicity, whether it's brighter than the kidney. We would then look for echo texture. Is it homogeneous or is there inhomogeneity? And finally, we would look at the liver surface. Uh, uh, so the moment there is deposition of hepatocytes, this is very well known to our radiology fraternity, is that the liver becomes brighter and then we lose the differentiation between the periportal fat and uh, the the liver parenchyma and of course the kidney is uh, is is the, uh, the comparative uh, factor and then finally we lose deep uh, we have a lot of deep attenuation and we lose the visualization of the diaphragm that's the normal liver that's the bright liver uh, which is hyperechoic to the kidney we have grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 uh, grade two is uh, grade one is when it is brighter than the kidney with normal uh, periportal echogenicity seen. Grade two when we don't see periportal echogenicity, and grade three when there is a lot of attenuation and we don't see the diaphragm that is seen here. So this has served its purpose, but we know that for milder grades of uh, steatosis that is between 5 and 20 percent, uh, ultrasound would uh, underestimate the prevalence of hepatic steatosis. And there can be a lot of intra and inter observer variability, specifically with uh, different machines, uh, different uh, settings, different gain settings. And it has been shown that uh, even if you have repeat measurements, uh, there is a lot of inter and intra observer variability in our diagnosis almost uh, the agreement rate is as low as 70 percent so uh, what what are we left with we are left with ultrasound and a lot of confusion sometimes with zero markers biochemical tests patients do online search there's clinical examination there is a bias there are most uh, uh, patients who are uh, indulging in bad diet will not acknowledge some in fact many of the times we have to actually extract information from them so the need of the r is is that we need a reliable non-invasive marker and shear wave imaging or uh, UGAP is the most ideal marker. It's non-invasive. It has all the benefits of ultrasound. Results are uh, immediate. It is integrated into our ultrasound platform. So we have imaging uh, along with shear wave and that I think is the biggest advantage compared to FibroScan. There are usually no measurement failures uh, even with uh, uh, obesity and ascites. So the, the, uh, the role of uh, imaging is, of course, stage of steatosis, differentiating fatty liver from fibrosis and progressive di disease. And uh, I think this uh, video is not playing, but uh, basically it was the first video that uh, Guru showed uh, at the beginning of this let, uh, lecture on the uh, development of this technology. So uh, the, the U-gap is the ultrasound guided uh, 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 attenuation parameter which uh, uses ultras, the same ultrasound beam uh, in, in, in the, the ROI here, which gets attenuated. And depending on the amount of attenuation, as you can see here, uh, we can analyze what is the degree of fat uh, deposition in the liver. So it's a very simple test. It takes exactly two minutes um, uh, to get the fat estimation and also the fibroscan value. So it is real time. Uh, 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 image guided and this is really the most important uh, advantage uh, uh, with uh, the, the, this kind of technology. It is an important indicator for fatty liver evaluation and the attenuation increases with increasing amount of fat. 
Now, basic steps, uh, we of course do it in supine position, at least four to six hours of fasting in the mid axillary line, essentially targeting segment five, six, seven, and eight, uh, uh, whichever is free of blood vessels. And uh, when we are doing a U gap, this is the kind of ROI, this is the beam that goes in and which gets attenuated and which is then measured. Uh, we usually use a C1 to 6 probe uh, and uh, the, the, we activate uh, in, in suspended respiration um, uh, the uh, U-gap button here. We press start and within a fraction of seconds, it will take multiple measurements, uh, multiple screen displays, and then you can measure uh, from left to right in a horizontal fashion at a depth of four to eight centimeters. So this ROI is fixed in size. You can move from one side to the other. And if the measurement is of good quality, the box will turn yellow. If it is of poor quality, it will turn red. Uh, that is one way of uh, one uh, very nice and excellent way of telling us that we are doing our job perfectly because we are always as concerned radiologists wanting to do the best for our patients and we don't want to have technology uh, that is uh, is ambiguous and is not giving us uh, appropriate results. So uh, we also have further quality checks. This is a color quality map. Uh, which can be changed in color. You can use blue, you can use red, and which tells us that the U-gap attenuation beam is homogeneous. It is of good um, quality and we can rely. So this is something that I think uh, is very commendable in, in this technology. We also have a quick color attenuation map, which tells us which are the areas of, of varying colors, uh, indicating that there is high fat in the, in the areas which are showing more uh, mix of yellow, orange, and red colors on this scale here. So this is the color attenuation map, and this is the color quality map. And you can see here that when we are measuring here in this, in, in this situation, uh, this box turns yellow, telling us it is reliable. Here, the box is red, indicating that it is not reliable, and we have to repeat the measurement uh, uh, again. So this is very, very important. The measurements are displayed in two formats. Uh, it is the attenuation rate that is decibels per meter, which is what is also uh, similar to what the gastroenterologists are used to on the fibro scan machine, or the attenuation coefficient, the dB plus uh, about centimeter per megahertz. So you can use either of them. Uh, and uh, what's important is that you should be free of any artifacts like the ribs, Try not to place the ROI on the diaphragm or close to the liver capsule. Of course, avoid all other organs uh, and then uh, we suspend respiration and we will take uh, multiple values in the, in, in the same segment of the liver. Now, this is the uh, 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 plot graph of uh, the different degrees of steatosis uh, mentioned on the left and the steatosis grade, which has been uh, correlated with biopsy. So you have the SO, S1, S2, S3 stage, and these are the cutoffs, uh, the scatter plots uh, from which uh, the, uh, the uh, cutoffs have been obtained. And these are the cutoffs that we use. So anything less than 0.5, uh, is uh, SO, 0.6 to 0.62 is S1, 0.7 and above is significant uh, steatosis that is 30% and above, and of course 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is more than 60%. Now, uh, the, the technology in fibroscan devices used by uh, uh, gastroenterologists is called the CAP, and uh, uh, it is uh, it is based on radio frequency attenuation. The, uh, uh, and uh, the, the it is the results are mentioned in decibels per meter. Now you can see that there are various studies which uh, will be not revealed to you by most gastroenterologists, where the uh, the accuracy of detecting low amount of fat is as low as a 0.823. And, uh, uh, and it is also affected by uh, the underlying disease, the body mass index, and uh, presence or action of ascites. But the biggest limitation, of course, is no visual guidance. And as I told you earlier, uh, even if you take two pathology specimens, you will get varying results. And uh, therefore, just relying on uh, point shear wave uh, imaging is, is not the appropriate way to do this disease. So... And this is a comparison of U-gap with liver biopsy 
uh, as you can see here, it correlates very well uh, on, on this uh, 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 with the p-value of less than 0 0.001. And also U-gap correlates well with CAP in that respect. But U-gap is scoring over uh, in lower stages of, in, in almost in all stages of steatosis, you can see in the area under the curve, it is 0.9 and above. As I, I was speaking earlier, even the uh, serum markers are 0.8. Gap is point, not achieving anything more than 0.8 as compared to U gap, which has got almost 0.9 uh, all through and through for uh, S1, S2, and S3 stage. So it's a very, very accurate uh, kind of uh, technology. And you can see repeated studies showing an accuracy of 0.95 and above, whereas CAP is 0.84. So the diagnostic capacity is higher uh, in um, uh, with CAP. A recent meta-analysis, and these are published uh, studies, uh, and I've just taken the conclusions, uh, uh, has shown that with individual patient data, has shown that CAP is not accurate enough in grading liver steatosis in patients with NAFLD. So you can see that the uh, oral uh, curve uh, the is uh, as uh, AUC and is 0 0.87, 0 0.7 for steatosis grades one, two, and three. So these are hepatic studies, gastroenterology studies, and not radiology studies. You can see Lass Lancet gastroenterology hepatology 2021. Now this was an uh, AIUM RSN study uh, which has concluded recently that uh, UGAP has performed significantly better than CAP for identifying steatosis with grade 2 or greater and 3 mode. So uh, this is also, and there are other studies which also they say the same. Uh, when you compare it with MR determined proton density fat fraction, ultrasound performs very well with a high performance accuracy of 0.9 or higher. So this is, uh, and we use, uh, they, they used a cutoff of 0.62 uh, to 0.69. So anything above that was significant fatty liver disease. So once we have established uh, who, uh, how do we treat, whom to treat, and how to treat. So these are some of the, um, uh, just uh, from, from the point of view of radiologists, now we have a new turf because patients are coming directly to us. They're asking us information. They're sometimes, uh, uh, you have to be armed with uh, dietary information, exercise information, because most of the times they come to you, they, they follow up with you. And uh, these are some of the simple methods. So you need to have good information on lifestyle modification. Of course, if, they, if their patient is on diabetes, you need to have uh, endocrinologists. Hepatoprotective uh, drugs like LIV52 and others have been proven to be very helpful. You have some herbal combinations and vitamin E also. So this is the general uh, what we follow, the hepatic uh, uh, hepatologists in our institute. So if you, the patients may come with fatty liver diagnosis or elevated liver enzymes, we do a sonography and identify whether there's fatty liver. They also do a clinical examination. And if there is evidence of metabolic syndrome in the form of um, uh, obesity, diabetes, triglycerides being high, low HDL, BP, then we would do a U-gap and a shear wave elastography. If it's a low score, we would institute diet, exercise, and uh, weight reduction. If it is a high score, then they would, there are lots and lots of new drugs uh, for diabetes, etc., uh, 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 new molecules like semaglutide uh, and etc., which will be used, uh, even metformin from the diabetic point of view and other GLP-1 analogs for obesity reduction. And these are, of course, the realm of the endocrinologist. Uh, uh, we are essentially uh, uh, useful at that stage. And of course, in end stage, you need a liver transplant. So this is the stage where things are reversible. This is the stage where the diabetologist and the endocrinologist can help. And of course, the hepatologist uh, can give you liver-directed treatment. Uh, it's very important that you counsel them for uh, lifestyle modification, diet modifications, uh, and you need, uh, because you can see in this chart that even a 5% weight loss can improve your liver fat and liver stiffness uh, scores. 7 to 10% will improve the NASH activity score and more than 10% weight loss, of course, over a period of time will cause improvement even in the fibrosis score. So this pyramid of care is very, very important from the point of view of our patients. Now coming to the next stage,
stage of the disease that is fibrosis and cirrhosis. That's where 2D shear wave ultrasound uh, is really beneficial. Ultrasound is good for the last stage of the disease. We can predict uh, cirrhosis very well, depending on the nodularity, the coarseness, the uh, splenic size, the Doppler changes. And uh, these are initially, of course, it can be homogeneous, smooth, then there can be irregularity, nodularity. These can be picked up very easily on ultrasound. We don't need to do 2D shear wave elastography uh, if you have multiple regenerating nodules. But it is these conditions where you are suspecting a slightly coarse liver or it's a fatty liver, uh, even without coarseness, uh, that's when um, uh, we need to do a 2D shear wave elastography. And you can see uh, elastography has gone through rapid changes from strain to point shear wave to what we now call 2D shear wave elastography. And there are a lot of novel imaging modalities like ultrasound, transient elastography, that is fibroscan, MRI, etc. But by far, I think ultrasound is the easiest technology. Now, this is just to show again what, what happens with fibroscan. It's a point shear wave uh, uh, estimation. Uh, it's a push pulse technology and only gives you one value, it will give you different values in different areas and you may get a lot of heterogeneous measurement. It's a blind technique. It has no Doppler information. Uh, it, it's You cannot get immediate uh, information uh, 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 on the liver uh, imaging and the fibroscan at the same sitting. These are some of the blind reports that you will get giving you uh, KPA values. And it has been shown that transient elastography is a dedicated machine, but it is more expensive. It is only with the hepatologist, so you can't use it as a broad uh, screening uh, tool for uh, everybody in this country. Uh, it's a selective use. Uh, you need to recalibrate this probe every now and then, and that's not happening. So you're going to get very poor follow-up results, and this needs to be done every 12 months. Uh, it, it fails in ob obese and uh, patients with ascites. There is no grayscale information. Performance definitely will be lower compared to shear wave imaging. And you can see what will happen in situations like this. This is a liver with the mass here. Now, if I did not know the presence of this mass and I do uh, 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 fibro scan blindly, you can imagine how much variation in the values you're going to get uh, in these conditions. And, uh, and this is another patient with, uh, incidentally, who came for a screening and we were seeing multiple tumors, multiple neuroendocrine tumors. And the, another very interesting case here uh, with uh, biliary tree dilatation seen only in this segment here. Rest of the liver was absolutely normal. You can see that. And so there is inflammation and some degree of obstruction here. So obviously, uh, if you are doing a blind technique to see the background of the liver, uh, you're going to target all these areas. And this is definitely going to give you uh, heterogeneous and uh, uh, varied uh, results. That's why uh, uh, in 2010, when we started using point shear wave elastography, that was the only technology available. It was one dimensional. Uh, there was no color differentiation, no ROA box. And we were very helpful when uh, we got 2D shear wave elastography because this was multidimensional. You could take multiple measurements from a single ROI. You can get measurements both in m uh, meters per second and KPA. There's color differentiation possibility and you have an ROI box. So this is point shear wave. We had to keep moving the shear wave point in different parts. And that would give us a lot of heterogeneous results. And th thankfully, uh, uh, with 2D shear wave that is uh, uh, sorted. Uh, now, you must remember that uh, liver stiffness can be affected by all these conditions, inflammation, cholestatis, hepatic, venous congestion, right, right heart failure. And therefore, uh, we need to have a proper history, pathology, and do a proper ultrasound and get the history before we embark upon the journey of doing 2D shear wave elastography. Now, there are some do's and don'ts. Essentially, we do it in supine uh, or left lateral decubitus with the arm, right arm placed upward so that there is widening of the intercostal space. We never image uh, close to the capsule because there can be reverberation artifact and false values. 
the the beam here as compared to u gap beam which need not be perpendicular here the beam has to be absolutely perpendicular to the liver surface and more than 2 cm in depth we usually keep the uh, uh, velocity measurement circle very small because if you keep it big you will get a uh, summary of various uh, uh, measurements and uh, um, uh, uh, then we target segment 5 6 7 we avoid excessive motion so patient has to be still with uh, respiratory uh, uh, suspension uh, the, uh, the the shadowing of the ribs has to be avoided and uh, we keep it below 2 cm and of course avoid local vessels and again here we have quality assessment quality is very very important when we are dealing with shear wave imaging this is something we never understood in the early part of 2d shear wave when we started doing in 2010 and always in uh, conferences when we used to demo we would get varied results and people would say this is not working so here you can now understand that this is the quality box color box this has to be homogeneously yellow and uh, only then we know that this is a good quality shear wave and then we take the measurements and again if it's a good quality shear wave the the measurement circle will be yellow otherwise it will turn red uh, and here you can see that below the capsule it will show you a uh, varied uh, attenuation values because of reverberation artifact now the, you can see here the shear wave quality is not good the circle has turned red so we will reject these values uh, this is a blood vessel that is here and you can see the quality map is telling you that it's not homogeneously yellow the shear wave quality is good not good there so we cannot take measurements there and this is shown repeatedly this is an area free of vessels you can see homogeneous yellow and that's where we will take the measurements now this was a study we did in 2010 Uh, and was published in the RSNA journal uh, where we did 100 cases with biopsy and uh, these were some of the values we established and very similar to what values we are subsequently uh, obtaining from the the G uh, fibro scan score so normal to mild will be 1.3 to 1.6 a mild to moderate 1.6 to 1.77 f3 is 1.77 to 1.9 and anything more than 12 kpa or 1.9 would be in the range of cirrhosis and these are different descriptive boxes and we now have guidelines from various societies on uh, uh, of how to do it and how to interpret it essentially very similar to what we have already spoken about so i'll skip the technique Uh, but this is the, the reporting technique of the SRU guideline of four. Uh, what they have done is they have uh, incrementally changed the value at four steps from five kPa to nine kPa to thirteen and above thirteen. And this, in these various steps, uh, confirms normal disease. This is less than nine in absence of clinical signs, rules out chronic active, uh, chronic liver disease. Nine uh, to thirteen kPa. Uh, suspect but needs further testing more than 13 uh, of course it is rules in chronic active chronic liver disease and more than 17 you expect portal hypertension with these cases so just a few run run up of a few cases uh, before we uh, show you how to report with our new software that we have developed just four five cases and then we'll open the discussion for questions now this is a very interesting case Uh, to highlight that uh, uh, we are now seeing a lot of obesity in the pediatric age group this was a 10 year old girl with precocious puberty and you can see all her liver enzymes are deranged we did uh, a u gap uh, it showed a very high value steatosis s3 uh, there was uh, no stiffness yet it, it was about 1.3 meters per second and that was her liver very typically bright you can see compared to the kidney but what was interesting was that we did a genetic evaluation of this patient because she would just not respond she was uh, late uh, with the metabolic syndrome extreme obesity uh, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, were surprised to find that she had the genes responsible for obesity and uh, nfld so this is now uh, like in most other conditions that we where we are started doing genetic studies uh, we have started identifying genetic etiology of nfld and uh, this is likely pathogenic you see both the genes here identified in this particular individual 
So that was the uh, values that we were seeing in that patient. Now, this is a patient with uh, extreme obesity, 139 kgs uh, uh, with diabetes, but very low cholesterol. So even very low cholesterol can, be, uh, can have a, a, a harmful effect. So you can see extreme low cholesterol and her values were in the range. There was fatty liver grade 2, UCAP measurement 0.89. You can see the liver, how bright and coarse it is. And uh, uh, it is steatosis above S3 because she was extremely obese and diabetic. But there was no fibrosis yet. Uh, as you can see, the uh, average shear wave was 1.2. Um, uh, this is another individual with a bright, uh, mildly enlarged liver with extreme fat and normal uh, liver fibrotic score. So even though uh, this patient has S3 steatosis, is not yet gone into fibrosis. So we, we can reverse this situation. This was a 50-year-old on ethanol. So this is obviously not fatty, uh, not any FLD. There is uh, already fibrosis and there is steatohepatitis with a uh, high degree of fat deposition. Uh, these livers are very large, very stiff, uh, most of the patients with alcohol. And immediately you can make out when you see these livers. This was a diabetic with uh, on glycophage uh, with, and statins, had three angioplasties. LFT uh, was normal, but uh, lipids were uh, deranged. And you can see that these are the values, steatosis S3 and uh, mild fibrosis. So uh, this is not a bad condition and can be controlled. This was a patient of rheumatoid arthritis. Just to show you different spectrum of conditions, she had been taking methotrexate for almost 10 years. Her previous fibro scan was in the range of cirrhosis almost. Uh, and uh, she had uh, almost like a fatty liver grade one. Uh, the, she, was, um, she was obese, but she has stopped her methotrexate and her uh, fibroscan values have dropped from 2.5 to 1.6 meters per second. So significant uh, reduction uh, and methotrexate was the cause of her. But she yet has a lot of fat because she is an obese individual. These, these were her liver pictures. The, this patient came to us with edema of the feet. That was the only clinical finding, came for a venous Doppler. And since we found nothing wrong, we just put our probe on the liver. And you can see it was an extremely bright liver. And these were the values. U gap in the S3 stage. And already she was in fibrosis. Uh, he was in fibrosis. So 1.67 meters per second. And that ultimately turned out to be the cause of um, the edema in the feet. This is a post liver transplant. So this is a, a, a situation very commonly where we are asked to do uh, a fibro scan. This was a patient with renal transplant who came in with chronic liver disease over a period of years. And uh, you can see that the, the uh, fibro scan values are 1.8 meter per second. And uh, so also the uh, fat estimation, uh, fat estimation was not very high. It was about 0.5 to 0.6. So these, these were last few cases. So finally, uh, over the years that we have been doing uh, ultrasound, uh, um, the UGAP and uh, 2D shear wave, uh, uh, a lot of people were always asking us as how, how do we report? Do we give only the shear wave velocity? Do we give what, et cetera? And you can see that um, we, because we have to be consistent in our results, we have to identify some known parameters which, uh, which we, we need to see on repeat evaluation. Because many times a patient comes on a repeat examination, if you take a different segment of the liver or uh, you know, in a different condition, your results may vary. So what we have uh, decided is that we must identify on our report as to where exactly we have sampled. So it will color highlight. It will then give us the attenuation coefficient, the, uh, the U gap, and it will give us the Young's modulus, and it will give us the stage of liver fibrosis, and if you want to add any comments. So all this comes uh, by feeding in the data just into an Excel sheet, and I will just show uh, that in a moment. So if, uh, to conclude this uh, talk, uh, this is a new role for radiologists. Obesity, of course, is a big problem. Liver is the target. The disease is reversible. And therefore, it's a new role for us to identify these conditions, quantify, accurately monitor progression of the disease, 
and help our patients uh, in, in whatever way that is possible to improve their liver and of course to avoid chronic liver disease and avoid biopsy. So I will end this component of the talk here and try and sh uh, share my uh, screen on the, uh, if I can, yeah. So uh, uh, can you see my screen, Guru? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, concept that we have developed and a lot of people have shown interest and I personally thank the GE uh, software engineers to help me to develop this. Uh, it is a very simple software. We have a, a template that is a reporting template here and we have a master list here. Uh, where we feed in the data. So you can see uh, that is the ultrasound scanning date, patient's weight, height, number of measurements that you have taken. You put the scan region. So you put seg segment five, segment eight. Then you will put your UGAP value. You will put your IQR median value and uh, the stiffness value that is in kilopascals and uh, some other, the IQR again here. And uh, you can modify these things here and then you can give the stage of liver fibrosis here and this will get reflected. So, for example, uh, I am uh, going to, uh, I will show, first show you the, so this is, uh, you can, uh, uh, we uh, enter job ID 3, for example, here. This was segment 5 we have selected, so it highlighted the blue here and uh, uh, I, I can change it here to... Uh, segment four, for example, but we don't image segment four, we image segment six, and you can see that it immediately highlights to you uh, what uh, what has been done. Of course, you get the name and referring physician, etc. Uh, and uh, from the values that you have measured already put in, so that, uh, this I have taken, uh, let's take job number four, for example, now. Uh, uh, it shows that I have taken 37 measurements, scan region is segment 6 in, in that job. Of course, I have changed it here. So it is selecting segment 6 here, and that's what is highlighted here. The UGAP value is 284. This is in decibels per meter. Uh, it gives you the IQR median here automatically. Uh, this is the stiffness that is measured, 15 kPa. IQR median, of course, the IQR median is uh, wrong. We have just fed it for uh, display purposes. 27% is not acceptable. Uh, I, I did not speak of the IQR median uh, earlier, but uh, IQR median is the variation of the measurement from the median value. So this should not be more than 30% for the UGAP and not be more than 15% for the KPA stiffness. So that, that is the importance. And then it will highlight with color here what grade of uh, uh, attenuation coefficient it is and what um, uh, stiffness value it is that you're dealing with. So, and then it will tell you the stage of liver fibrosis. Of course, the, uh, we need to uh, uh, the, the modify this. It, this is uh, just dummy values that we have put in. Uh, I will take uh, again uh, uh, the plot number one and you can see that uh, no, uh, maybe we'll put plot number two, I think. And uh, so uh, it will uh, give us the, that it is showing F2 here and this is SO here. It is highlighted that and uh, then uh, that will be the report uh, that is seen. So going back to the master list, you can, you can modify these values. So you can see that uh, here, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we can change these values. IQR median is say 15%. And this is about 10%. And uh, uh, stage of liver fibrosis. So then we go in and see here. And uh, we go back to... Job number one, and you get stage of liver fibrosis, stage three. This is what you have fed in, uh, but the values of this patient are uh, 280, so it is S3 stage, uh, 9.2 kPo, and that is F2 stage. So this is a very, this is going to be very, very useful, and I am sure you will enjoy using it. And I think uh, uh, Guru is opening this for all the GE users to use uh, from today, if I'm correct. Uh, 
so I thank you for a very patient hearing. And if there are questions, we can answer and we can also go for the poll uh, that is now possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much you know, for a very <coughs> informative session. And as you rightly said that uh, uh, fatty liver diseases are progressing across the world. And in India, you know, when you said that, you know, one in three, uh, which is an alarming figure. And uh, with the help of this uh, new innovation, you know, by doing the diagnosis in very early stage, I'm sure, you know, we can create a better health for everyone and for the, you know, better health for India also. So now uh, we have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, interesting questions. Uh, uh, because of the with the shortage of time, you know, we have shortlisted uh, four questions. Uh, the first question to you, sir, uh, which patient we have to go for UGAP and shear wave or they have to be done together? Yeah, so most of the times I do together for both the uh, for for every patient I do it. Uh, uh, I do I start with U gap. I start by analyzing the fat because if the fat is very high. I know that first I need to address the fat. Then of course we have taken the history. We know from the background whether there's hepatitis, whether uh, viral markers are positive, or whether there's history of ethanol. So, uh, but uh, uh, both the techniques are done together. So the management is dependent on both the techniques being done together, and that's why the advantage of logic because you have both the uh, uh, U gap and the uh, on the same transducer on the same platform. Yes, sir. Yeah, great. And the second question is. Uh, can UGAP uh, replace liver biopsy? Yeah, uh, in the sense that, see, it has been well shown. Uh, UGAP is for basically for fat estimation. And uh, these are, uh, if, if you don't have fibrosis, then you don't need biopsy because essentially you're doing a lifestyle modification. Uh, so why we, we really don't need to do a biopsy in a patient who is only suspected of having uh, uh, NAFLD, uh, which can be very well studied with UGAP. And uh, there are various studies, uh, as I told you earlier, which has been already correlated it's like we no longer do a biopsy to prove cirrhosis now we either do ultrasound or we do shear wave similarly for hepatocellular carcinoma we no longer do biopsy we do a, a, a mri or ct scan uh, you know to con contrast enhanced imaging is good enough so similarly for fatty liver we don't need to do a biopsy anymore well said sir and sir uh, uh, the next question is uh, how shear wave and you get uh, useful in uh, uh, measuring uh, progression, you know, uh, uh, how you can do the follow ups and the. Yeah, uh, so uh, essentially we follow up every six months uh, uh, with uh, if the patient has instituted therapy, then we would look for regression of disease. And of course, if the patient is not following our uh, advice and uh, they also come back, you know, many patients who are continuing, there, there are people who just cannot uh, stop alcohol and uh, they enjoy their regular drink. Uh, they may not be consuming too much, but they consume a regular amount. So these are other people who also come for regular monitoring. Once in a while, we have found the disease progressing and we tell them that maybe worthwhile uh, reducing the quantity of liquor or moving to a more milder form of liquor. If there is somebody who is a non-alcoholic, then of course, uh, guidelines. Uh, we uh, the, What I have seen very helpful is the value. When you give a value, uh, a, a measured value to a patient, rather than just saying fatty liver, uh, when we are putting it down on paper with a value and with this graphic display of the scale of involvement of the liver, uh, especially with this new software that you have developed with us, this is uh, very impactful on the patient's mind. And uh, they see these and they come back and they store it on their phone and they come back and they show us again that, you know, my scale was here. I have lost 10 kgs. Can you repeat and see? So the re repeat uh, is uh, possible with these technologies. Every six months, we would do it. Agree, sir. And as you rightly said, that when you have the data recorded in the yeah. software, you know, the follow up will be very easy for. Easy, yeah. So, this is, I think, it, I think this is the first time in the world where there is a reporting software that has been developed. I have never, uh, having gone to conferences worldwide, including RSNA various times, uh, and even Richard Brar was very happy, I must tell you, to see this uh, reporting format. Uh, nobody has developed this. So, I should congratulate you because uh, with your help, I could make this possible. It was my dream to have uh, uh, something to report for everybody that can be used. 
it's a completely your master brain there and because i knew that in a where uh, you really pushing us that you know we need to have a data because yeah data is the future fuel you know which which you said that word yeah so sir uh, the last question you know in fact two questions clubbed in that uh sometimes share with uh, sampling uh, values uh, significantly okay and uh, how to tackle this that is one and uh, second is uh, can we use this uh, technologies in uh, as it is so these are the two questions right? okay yeah. uh, so uh, there are some more questions which have come up popped up on my screen but anyway um, 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 so I, as i told you earlier you know when uh, the, if you uh, there are a lot of pathology studies which say uh, that there is a lot of inaccuracy even if you sample two areas because this is a very heterogeneous disease uh, the uh, all the areas may not be affected similarly so you can take multiple measurements at different areas take the highest value for example and uh, or when you are in one box as i told you earlier we take about 10 measurements and we 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 reject the extreme of measurements so we take the median value and uh, we reject the extremes because you are going to get uh, the varied values and what we are interested in is is a, a median value many of the times uh, i will see chronic liver disease and i will get homogeneous values i will get 8 to 10 values which are very similar and therefore the iqr median ratio is uh, less than 15% so this tells me that uh, the, there is homogeneity in the disease in that particular individual and yeah. then again it the liver is you know not blasted with one pathology we have like i showed you the chart there is about 100 pathologies affecting the liver so there are toxins there are now the last patient i just said he was having three uh, packets of uh, tobacco gutka every uh, every day and his liver was so heterogeneous believe me there were areas which were normal areas which were abnormal so you have to use 2d imaging to guide uh, the uh, shear wave to a particular area and then get the good quality beam and take the maximum value and then again average it from the median value uh, uh, remove the extreme values and that's how we will come to a final value and all of this has to be recorded so we have that's why made the software where you are actually seeing what is your iqr median which segment of the liver you have measured it previously uh what has been the value earlier and therefore this software is going to be very very useful because uh you know you uh, sitting in your clinic sometimes you don't have old reports uh etc uh, but when you have this software with you uh, you can immediately identify and this will reduce the errors because you're sampling the same site segment 5 segment 6 whatever you have sampled earlier um you have you are looking at the iqr median if it was 30 before and 15 now you know that there, there is that slight variation so all these factors are going to reduce the error uh, in uh, in a very heterogeneous disease it's not a homogeneous disease affecting the liver you could have three toxins at the same time you could have lipid you could have gl glucose diabetes you could have a virus you could have alcohol so multiple factors which are all altering the liver pathology Yes, sir. Yeah, great, uh, sir. You know uh, we are uh, you know nearing to the end of the session, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, sir. I have some yeah. two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir. yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, it is coming as a direct message. I don't know yeah, how. Yeah. 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 So, how to stage fibrosis with two D shear wave elastography values, sir? So, I did show you that chart. Uh, earlier which uh, showed you the cutoffs uh, of uh, various uh, degrees of fibrosis uh, that is 1.3 1.7 and above 1.9 uh, f1 f2 f3 and also using the software it will become easy because it will automatically show you the in color uh, what stage of uh, fibrosis you are dealing with uh, the next question is how to correlate between sru guidelines and metavir scoring so uh, it is very clear uh, i mean uh, we use both together and again uh, the software that we have prepared uh, uh, solves that problem because uh, it it gives you the value and it gives you the correlate of uh, the severity of the disease on the bar graph so th those were the two direct questions which came in that's great sir that's great fine fantastic so sir uh, 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 thank you so much thank you so much for your valuable time you know in this beautiful sunday and uh, uh, thanks for all the participants you know who has taken time now the time out you know uh, in your valuable you know days uh, so now uh, uh, we have the next session which is a polling session 
uh, we will move to the polling session now and shweta over to you uh, can you uh, pose the question shweta cha yeah thank you so they are very easy questions uh, i think you will be getting it very well yeah so, so a quick is, information for all the people users who are using their mobile you will see a three dots click on that then you can find the poll so i can see the first question is well answered because everybody has understood the uh, has been alert in the talk yeah so that that's i think 100% so absolutely no ambiguity guru everybody knows what is you gap thank you sir you know <laughs> yours it's, it's it's very important to know the early stage of technology i would say right yes yes so we no longer will call it uh uh fiber scan we'll call it you gap you gap yeah can we move to the next question next question yeah, yeah. so when do we call steatosis more than 5% more than 10% more than 33% okay so this is a very tricky question actually <laughs> I, i'm very uh, curious to see the answer because yeah this actually reflects what i had in my mind uh, all of them are correct <laughs> i must give you an answer before <laughs> but it's the real answer is let's see so which of the four all correct answers is the most correct so i think yeah i mean these are all correct answers i i must say that uh, all uh, but uh, more than 5% of liver cells having fat is what we call nafld but uh, all the answers are correct so it was a, it was just a question to uh, mislead rather so we can go for the next question yeah yes so this is also following a, a good uh, so people have been alert except a few two or three people yeah so that's that's correct so 
So it's a, it's a, it's a reversible disease, and therefore this is really the most important part of uh, the seminar is that we can help a lot of patients with this technology, and it's a reversible disease, and uh, we must remember and give hope to our patients and give them proper counseling and guidance. And uh, this will expand your turf as radiologists. You will be a clinical radiologist because they will be coming to you. Believe me, I'm, a lot of patients come repeatedly directly to us uh, asking us about the values, about what they are doing in their lives, uh, their counseling and etc. And uh, it's really an interesting uh, you know, uh, moment for us because it, uh, it makes life more interesting when we are clinically correlated well with our patients. Okay, so people are very alert. Yeah, it's an action plan, you know, for what <laughs> we need to do it in our routine life. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, believe me, uh, you know, in the last 10 years that I have been using this te technology now, and uh, I'm very uh, careful about how much alcohol I take. Uh, initially, we were not really worried. And more so, uh, I think uh, the number one, of course, all of the above here as is showing is, 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 uh, is the correct answer. Uh, but uh, I, would say, I would tell you that, uh, uh, of course, ethanol is, is definitely, most people will have diabetic control, but it's really diet control. Diet control is the, the, the number one. The answer is correct, all of the above. But... The, the real answer is diet control. 90% of uh, weight loss and uh, uh, better health is diet control. Limit the calorie intake. So in the metabolic syndrome that I was talking about, the metabolic uh, now what we call uh, fatty liver disease, uh, is, is, is about the amount of calories, not uh, what you eat. It's the total amount of calories that you eat in the day. And that's why we have a lot of these fads coming in intermittent fasting. And a patient yesterday just told me something new. That she said, I'm on the OMAD, that is one meal a day. And, you know, and she has lost a lot of weed, uh, weight. And this technique is called OMAD. So it's, it's all about the amount of calories. Uh, you need to only have enough calories that much you are burning. You know, if you are, you know, eating for the sake of eating, and uh, really consuming more al calories than you're burning, then that's not good for our health. So 2D shear wave uh, is is a measurement of shear wave values in a in a ROI box with uh, a color map of the uh, of the 2D box uh, telling us where you are measuring in the 2D uh, image uh, of the segment of the liver and also with the quality map and uh, the answer is absolutely correct. It is measures the stiffness of the liver. So all technologies indirectly give us this measurement of the stiffness of the liver, which is uh, what we talk about fibrosis. So as I think there's the last question. And this shows the changing uh, trends over the years that we have been seeing as the etiopathogenesis of cirrhosis. And uh, this answer will actually reflect what you and me need to do in our daily lifestyles. Uh, don't eat for the sake of eating. 
don't live to eat eat to live and eat limited limited number of calories 1300 to 1500 calories a day ethanol although it is less than 14 drinks a week i would say 2 to 3 drinks a week is is enough and uh, maybe on a weekend if really you have to so there's a mixed bag here but really the broad speak is that nash is the leading cause of cirrhosis and which is very very surprising and very alarming because most people don't realize it and even today when we see a, a mother telling us that the, i i want a healthy baby i want a chubby fat baby we have to put them on guard you know chubby fat means juvenile diabetes and so this is really not good for our health so as as a last word i i would say Uh, of course we use these technologies for our patients and uh, for uh, uh, our profession but for all of us we need to be healthy to do that and uh, the message is that keep our liver healthy eat only as much as you need and limit the calories that we need thank you guru for this wonderful program and we really enjoyed uh, being with uh, your team here thank you sir thank you so much and uh, very interesting uh, polling questions you know and lot of you know uh, information and messages i would say and uh, thank you so much for all the participants uh, uh, who has joined in this uh, uh, almost more than hour webinar and uh, uh, as, as sir said that you know uh, let's let's make lot of changes you know in our lifestyle as you said that you know to, to make our liver healthy and live a healthy life yeah thank you thank you so much